Hey, Yannick, welcome to uh, an Animus conversation. It's great to have you here with us today. I'm super glad to be here. It's always super nice to talk to you, especially uh, with the topic that we have in mind. <laughs> Absolutely. So let, let's jump on in there. So today I'm going to be talking with Yannick about positive psychology and its relationship to coaching. So I guess to kind of get some framing in the space, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, how you work with positive psychology? Sure. Oh, well, small question to start with. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I guess the, the, the essence of it that I kind of crystallized over the year is that in coaching, anybody who's ever come into my coaching space wanted to be happy or happier in some form or shape. So uh, they wanted to, you know, have better relationships or feel better about themselves, relate to other people better, find a sense of meaning or purpose. Uh, they want to grow or make some meaningful change, um, development, accomplishments. You know, and all of these areas that people want to get some coaching on, um, when you look at the theories of positive psychology, of well-being and happiness and, you know, what, what is a good life, uh, what, what creates life satisfaction and, you know, what is this thing called happiness? If you look at the scientific theories, and there's now over 20 years of uh, empirical research within positive psychology, and then there's a lot more philosophy and psychology before that, uh, not particularly under that banner, um, all, of, all, all of those things are in those theories, you know? Um, if you look at what, what happiness consists of, what are its pillars, all of these things come up and I see them coming into my coaching room with that. So on, in some form or shape, people come to be happier or happy. And that's why I thought positive psychology is so relevant uh, to coaches. You know, there's almost nothing more relevant as a starting point, in, as an end point even. Yeah, and I guess that a lot of uh, coaching is you know exploring or searching for what does it mean to be happy what does it mean to live mm -hmm. a, a good life mm -hmm. and that's kind of what our clients are, are seeking and i guess sometimes people get a bit confused or clouded with this you know being happy is it you know mm -hmm. is it ignoring the, the darker edges and the uncomfortable mm -hmm. pieces and just sitting with the smiley stuff and just what's, what's your thoughts on that yeah, that's a super valid uh, concern. And it's actually one that I had when uh, I, I kind of fell into positive psychology because I was lucky enough to study it straight after my, my bachelor's degree in psychology. And I, I found this module and uh, that happened to be run by one of the people who founded the, uh, by the person who founded the second masters in the world on positive psychology. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to do that then. Um, and uh, that's how I got into it. And then after a year and a half of studying uh, at depth, um, you know, what's right with people, essentially. Um, that's what positive psychology as a branch of science is about, to, you know, research what's, what's going well. Mm -hmm. um, I found that a lot of uh, positive psychologists, they were a little bit too positive for my taste. You know, positive psychology as a science was always meant to look at the things that we're not looking at enough in science right now. Um, you know, often what the, where the research money is and what people are concerned about are what's broken you know, and how can we fix it? Where's a problem and how can we make the problem go away? How can we come back to a sense of normality or, you know, um, so positive psychology was always meant to, in, to, to complete psychology as usual, to add something that we're currently missing. Um, but if you focus only on the positive, in some instances it can work, you know, um, sometimes we don't need to talk about the problem and we can focus on the solution. But in most cases, it's not enough. You know, you can't just ignore the negative. That's what often what people come to us with. And that's how I kind of came from positive psychology and then, um, then went into existential coaching, which kind of gave me a framework for, um, for understanding people and making sense of them in there in, as a whole. But it allowed me to bring all of these amazing positive psychology tools and interventions, the theories, the concepts, the knowledge in, into my coaching framework. So I don't think that positive psychology coaching, only looking at the kind of positive things is efficient in itself. But if we integrate the findings from positive psychology into our existing coaching framework, it can be extremely powerful. It can give us a, um, a language to talk about what people want. It can give us a lots of tools and interventions and techniques and like lots of useful stuff that our clients can use and that we can use to live better lives. 
I, yeah, I love the, the roundedness of, of which you speak that, that the, uh, the holistic nature of the work where we're not ignoring something. Cause we, you know, we, when I talk to some uh, positive psychologist, I kind of go, oh, that sounds really happy and wonderful, <laughs> but where's the other stuff that's part of the human condition and how do we look at that? And, and listening to you talk there, but as you bring in the existential stuff, it's like, okay, there's the, the richness and the roundedness of the human condition that we, that we can work with as coaches. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be existential generally. Like for example, the, um, first there was positive psychology with all these new research findings in the early 2000s. And it's like, oh, being happy is so good for you. You're going to earn more money. You're going to have, have better relationships. You have more sex. You sell more stuff, you know, and all of that was pretty exciting. You know, you're, you're healthier, you're happier. Why wouldn't anybody be more happy? Um, but then the European wave came in and they were a lot more critical about the research as Europeans uh, often are, uh, at least uh, in terms of like, well, uh, let's not get into stereotypes. But there <laughs> certainly was a more critical wave that came out uh, like about five years later. Um, and now what we had emerged in the last uh, five years or so uh, is the second wave of positive psychology, positive psychology 2.0, as it's often called, which includes, uh, for me, very clearly existential themes, but it basically looks at uh, positive psychology is more than just looking at zero to plus 10. You know, there's a lot of positive psychology you can apply as a, a means to, towards post-traumatic growth, for example, or for people who feel a bit depressed, you know, for people who are, who are suffering or whose life is very challenging. So there is a lot of positive psychology that we can use in that uh, minus 10 to zero spectrum if you wanted to categorize it as mm. crudely as that. So yeah. there's a lot of development to make it more whole, which I, I really appreciate. Yeah, it, it, it sort of sounds like, and, and this is perhaps too crudely putting it, that it's almost like a, a set of tools that you can apply in multiple areas and dimensions to bring about that looking at what is working well with somebody. Yeah, and hearing you reflect that back, this is, this is what I think is the most exciting part about positive psychology coaching at the moment. Because positive psychology coaching as such, as a term, as a fixed thing, as a well-defined approach to coaching, it doesn't quite exist yet. There's uh, plenty of people out there, well, let's say um, enough people out there who work with positive psychology and have integrated positive psychology into the way they coach or have, have taken positive psychology as a, as a central grounding to their work how they relate to people, how they understand what they're looking for, or implementing the, the interventions and the tools and the techniques in a way that they would then call positive psychology coaching. But academically, there isn't really um, a well-defined and agreed upon approach that is positive psychology coaching with a clear uh, case book or um, you know, playbook on these, this is what we do in the six sessions. You know, they're out there, these um, well-formulated approaches, but really, it's, it's quite exciting because it's, you can shape it in the way that you feel is most uh, valuable to your clients. You, know, you can take those positive psychology gems and bits and integrate it in a way that you think will make sense when, when you work with somebody. And so it's quite free and very exciting feel to be involved in right now. Yeah, I, I sort of, you know, I completely feel your, your excitement as we, we have this conversation. And I sort of go, there's something quite nice when something hasn't been fully defined yet. And it has those blurry edges because it allows us to not feel too rigid within the work that we do. I think sometimes when we categorize something too heavily, that we go, right, so it's only that, as opposed to it's that and more. And it's yeah. that and everything we, we bring to it. Yeah, and I've just recently listened in on a conversation between a former colleague of mine, Christian von Neuerberg, from the uh, Masters at, at UEL, and uh, Robert Biswasdina, one of the pioneers, uh, the first person who, who wrote about positive psychology coaching. And they were in conversation and uh, produced uh, uh, two, two papers on defining positive psychology coaching. And they both said, well, coaching is just, positive psychology coaching is just coaching. You know, you coach somebody, but my line of questioning will be influenced by what I know from the science. Then there's people like uh, my colleague Susie Green, for example, who uh, wrote one of, the, one of the most important books right now on positive psychology coaching, who said, well, we, we have an obligation almost to share with our clients bits and pieces from the research and from the knowledge. Um, so there's, 
there's interesting different approaches, mm. even among the top names in the field who say, well, here's how I use positive psychology in my coaching. Some define it more clearly and combine it perhaps with solution focused coaching. Um, some integrate it into a, like me into an existential framework. Others that just, you know, be quite intuitive being with somebody, the kind of more humanistic presence uh, focused approach to coaching. And so I think there's something in positive psychology for, for everybody. And uh, I, I hence um, structure my trainings in a way that I don't say this is positive psychology coaching and this is how you do it. I say, here's positive psychology. Here's various bits and pieces that are directly relevant for coaching practice. Now you go ahead and look at these and tell me what you think. See how you make sense of that. What could you see yourself using? Maybe you could start working with strength, give every coaching client a strength assessment uh, to start the conversation, like many would do with a personality profiler, for example. You know, it's a great way to start coaching. Others, they would just uh, reflect strengths back and identify them in their clients as they're working with it. You know, others would just not really touch on those with any particular language, but they would probably have a sense of what somebody is really good at. You know, but knowing the science behind strengths and how it can be incredibly energizing and providing meaning and, uh, you know, a certain energy to how you experience your human condition, you know, that will, that will be valuable, I think, for every coach, regardless of how exactly you're going to use it. And there's, there's something I really uh, love about these conversations with you, and that's the, the richness of the research that you bring to your, your coaching. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of wonder how, how does that or does it have an impact on you? Do you get sometimes get caught up in the, the, the research as opposed to the, the practice? How do you manage that? Yeah, I think in the beginning it was a bit difficult because as we're hearing the research, and I mentioned the, the first wave of research earlier, it can be very tempting to, to want to be leading and guiding people to say, hey, look, but this is so important and we have some evidence, some strong evidence that you should really be doing these kind of things. You know, meditation, exercise, a uh, good healthy diet, um, uh, you, sh you should get enough sleep. You know, Th these are all bits that we kind of know from positive psychology. You know, um, you should be really looking at that if you want to be happier. It's, uh, it's tempting to want to give that to people. But I think every coach will know with a little bit of experience that guiding somebody towards something uh, is not always a good idea. You know, some people approach you for coaching to get that kind of advice. Are we still coaching then? You know, is that not <laughs> a bit more like mentoring or perhaps happiness consultancy? Um, I, I kind of stopped being so um, protective of what coaching is and isn't. Because ultimately, every coach will need to sit down with a, a prospect or a potential client and say, here's the kind of work I do and here's how I'm doing this. Do you want to work with me on that basis? And I know some positive psychology coaches who, who, give, who put a lot of that science on the table. And they say, look at that. That seems relevant. What do you think? Here's what some of the research has found. Not, not, not saying that this is you and this will definitely work for you. Just saying that for most people, most of the time, here's an intervention that could get you what you, what I, what, what you seem to want. What do you think? Would that work for you? And it's directive, or let's say maybe directional. Um, <laughs> and I think every coach has to make a decision how they relate to coaching and how they relate to their work and how they want to apply positive psychology. And, and I think there's something there for me about, you know, how do we want to educate our clients? What's the, not how we want to educate them as if they need our input on education, but how do we share our knowledge? How do we share our understanding? How do we share how we have come to this place? And therefore, mm -hmm. this is why we're doing our work. And I think there's something really important in sharing that, whether that's in the session itself, I, I might challenge that. But I do, you know, like, like the book that you've written about existentialism, I think there's something really important to share our work in the world so people can look at it and read it and understand it. And then have that as part of the reasons why they're making choices to come and work with us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a crucial question that every coach needs to ask themselves. Like, is it valuable that I do some education here? Um, you know, is it valuable for my client that I, I share some of the knowledge that I possess? Or is it important that every client creates their own knowledge and I'm merely a facilitator holding space for somebody learning? Mm. And I think in, positive in the field of positive psychology coaching, there's probably more of the former. 
just because you know we do know a lot of stuff about this but i think it's it's crucially important that coaches make that decision for them and i would say that for every coach regardless of how how did you answer that kind of question for yourself there's something in positive psychology that you'll be able to use because what i what i often uh, find quite helpful in for from positive psychology is what are you not talking about so for example if somebody comes in with a goal of i i don't feel happy with my life i want to be happier let's just put it quite vaguely as that uh, and then uh, we explore that a little bit and they tell me about how they have good relationships and uh, how they you know quite happy with who they are at this moment um, they have a sense of meaning and, and purpose in their life uh, they have a, a, a lot of sense of autonomy um, they have the right skills to deal with their environment uh, but that sense of accomplishment seems to be missing I'm not saying that it's missing I'm saying I haven't heard you talk about that yet I, so I... these theories give me give me a space where I can say what about this? Not saying that it's missing, but saying, oh, I'm get curious about that. And maybe it is, maybe it's not. But yeah, I, I love these conversations because I often do that within my coaching. And I would say predominantly, I, I guess I'm a narrative coach, very much looking at, you know, what's the story that exists? Uh, who's the characters that exist within that story? And which character are you? And, and how are you playing out your character within this story and, and within your setting? And for me, there's something really interesting about what are we not talking about? What's not being brought into the story that exists and we're aware of its existence, but we're not bringing it to the story. And mm -hmm. what's that about? I find that really <laughs> fascinating when you start to unpick that and bring that into the yeah. space. Yeah. And then it's become so important to not say that part is missing, but it should be there in your life. But I haven't heard you talk about that. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And then they might say, well, actually, I don't need that part in my life. And, you know, I can bracket what I think I know about my theories. And I'm predominantly work with what's their theory. Yeah. You know, and I, if I have a strong sense that, you know, if somebody says, oh, relationships just aren't important to me, I don't need other people, I can be on my own, then from a positive psychology perspective, I can challenge that, you know, and I would I would want to challenge that because I just there, there is a knowledge that for most people, most of the time, relationships are incredibly important. And that I haven't met anybody who's, comp who's happy, like genuinely happy, completely on their own. Hmm. You know, there, there's mean, we, at least one or a few people that they have positive relationships with. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's really interesting that, we, that you can talk about it from a, a positive psychology lens or perspective, because I think that allows somebody to go, oh, okay, that, that perspective explores that. Okay, I can then look into that and explore that and delve into that mm -hmm. some more if, if I want to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is uh, how we would contract that at the beginning as well. If we were to use positive psychology, people who approach me for coaching, they tend to know that I have that background, even if it's uh, some agency work with organizations, you know, usually I will tell them that this informs the way that I work. And people tend to be really interested in that because first of all, it sounds very attractive. Positive psychology is a great name. You know, um, it certainly makes people interested in knowing more about ooh, positive psychology. What's that? What's negative psychology? And all of a sudden you find yourself in a conversation. And in terms of networking, for me, that was amazing because at any event, I would say, oh, I, I study positive psychology or, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a positive psychology perspective into my coaching. Without fail, people tend to be, oh, interesting, blah, 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 you know, and all of a sudden you're in a conversation and you have a really good conversation about what's right with people. And I think starting with a client with that kind of premise uh, it's fun. It's fantastic. First of all, it feels really good. And we know from positive psychology that positive emotions, uh, uh, they broaden our thought action repertoire, as Fredrickson's theory goes, which means people are more creative, people are more resourceful, they become more resilient, you know, all by invoking some positive emotions. So it doesn't mean that every coach has to be all smiley and cracking a joke when they start the session. But like, if they were to do that, authentically and genuinely, it has a lot of positive effects. And we know that now because we can find evidence, we can test it and we can see what effects it has. I remember reading Barbara Fredrickson's book a, a while back and mapping out my positive emotions throughout the day and noticing where we, where we naturally have a dip throughout the uh -huh. day or through our week and just kind of being able to go, ah, oh, okay. So though I won't do certain tasks at that time of the day or at that point of the week, because I know my, where my mood is going to naturally flow mm -hmm. into. 
but likewise being able to go, oh, so at that point in the day, I slip into this, right? What am I going to do to help myself with that? So generating an, an awareness through, through a, um, a checking process, a kind of a, a reviewing process of how we're showing up. Yeah. And talking about flow and slipping into things, this is an area that initially caught me. Before I knew about positive psychology, um, I, I studied and I wrote a dissertation piece of research on, uh, on flow, uh, which is a pure form of engagement. It's when you completely forget about time yeah. and you're so involved in what you're doing, your concentration is full on and we tend to produce the best results when we're in that state because one, like, we're just so involved in like we have the skills to work with our environment and there's a good balance and time just flies and we at some point we realize oh we're really hungry and it's gotten dark you know these are states of optimal performance and there's things we can do informed by positive psychology to create the conditions for people to to be more in flow or be more engaged in what they're doing so when you look at uh, our performance at work or how we experience you know a, a quite mundane activity how can we make it more engaging you know, in those states, they're so enjoyable and we want to be in those more um, because then, you know, time becomes this, this enjoyable thing. And, you know, then we feel good when we come out of these states. I think everybody will have had an experience of that. And so, positive psychology, we can use it to create them more. I remember uh, looking at Mihaly, Chisnik Mihaly's book when I was doing uh, creative work back in the day with creative partnerships. And we were looking at how do we uh, enable or create learning environments that put people in the state of flow so what what were the ingredients necessary to enable it was mainly young people i was working with them but how do we get them into that place of flow through creating engaging um sensory rich environments and activities so they would just be in the work doing the work completely absor absorbed in it mm -hmm. and come out the other side of all of this learning and understanding <laughs> without having to go through the trudgery of learning as they were yeah. perceiving it. Yeah, imagine being energized after a long day's work rather than depleted. That's what we're talking about when we create more flow states or more engagement in our daily activities. May that be work or any other activity. Super interesting. Also, how we can actually measure those states. And this is where the science comes in. You know, scientists always want to measure things so that we can actually create evidence and some numbers. And while numbers and evidence and assessments may not be interesting to all coaches out there, I think it's, it's super valuable to have that as an, as an option for a client who might love numbers, you know, well, that, especially, in, co yeah, no, especially in coaching when we're, <laughs> especially in coaching when we, um, when we're, we're trying to figure out if that worked, you know, what we're doing here, does it work? How can we monitor progress? There's so many clients who would love that. And there's so many coaches who would say, look, you went from four to six. You know, with another psychometric assessment, it might be going from 33 to 38, you know, um, depending on what that is. But positive psychologists have found so many different measures now for positive emotions and mindsets and locus of control, resilience, meaning and purpose, um, strengths. There's so many things we can measure now with, uh, with not just a, quest a questionnaire or a one to 10 scale, but very, very sophisticated. And I think there's a real value in that from positive psychology. Um, and I, I always uh, reserve a little bit of time to talk about psychometrics and talk about how they can be valuable, or how they can be delivered in coaching or how they can be used in coaching that we don't put people in boxes, but rather take it as an entry point into a conversation. That's that. And, and that was so my point uh, that, that was kind of mulling through my head then is this, <laughs> this idea of that sometimes when people have approached me around psychometric testing and then done evaluations on me, I've always often felt that they've put me in a box and gone, this is now you. As yeah, opposed to going, test. <laughs> this is a, this is a, it's a start point. And that then <clears throat> has created a real, uh, over time, a negative uh, energy around that work. And whilst mm -hmm. I get that it's so, it can be so valuable and, you know, it's client dependent, right? And coach mm -hmm. dependent, you know, which who's fired up by looking at numbers and charts and, yeah. and who's turned off by that. Yeah. And, and that depends on the client. Absolutely. You know, um, I have, I have one, I, I hate the word test um, because it implies that you can fail it. Yeah. 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 I think that's the other thing when, when you call something, a, you know, I'm going to do this test on you, you kind of go, so I can get this oh. wrong. Right. Or, <laughs> yeah. or, it, you know, the outcome of this might mean that you don't want to work with me. What, yeah. What's that about? 
Yeah, that's why, like, when you use the terminology like that as a coach, uh, as in questionnaire or survey, for example, mm. the VIA survey of character strength, you can't fail it. You just have a different set of strengths to other people, which is quite normal, you know. But there is no, there is no failing the test because there is no test. It's just, and uh, even assessment is a bit dodgy as a as a terminology. Although other people might love it. Yeah. Uh, other people love tests. They love doing a test. Like, oh yeah, test, give it to me. And I want to <laughs> test myself and see where I'm at. But it's always a snapshot at that moment in time of you. Yeah. And yeah. it can lead to amazing conversations when yeah. you have some of those numbers. I remember working with Simon Weston and him talking about that this is a start point. This is not the end. This is, we don't end our coaching by going, here's the results. The results are just a start point for a conversation and an exploration to explore what's what's interesting or exciting or challenging or shocking about what's being thrown up here and then to look at it and understand it and reflect upon it and go oh okay so that is me i can see that now or i just don't see that in myself but other people might see that in me yeah absolutely and uh, i do with the clients who love numbers it's quite nice to have this uh, initial starting point of you know, uh, what are some of those numbers that you gave yourself? I call them the, the life rate monitor. You know, uh, there's like, okay, so autonomy, um, I'm at six out of 10, you know, I feel I can do whatever I want, whenever I want to a certain degree. Um, and it's nice to see that at the end of the coaching or in the middle or perhaps six months after and see what changed. Not necessarily as a result of the coaching, but things change. And it's nice to acknowledge that as a client. Yeah, there's a, there's a business book called Measure What Matters. And it's about, you know, you have to check in on these, these metrics, on these numbers to know where you are at any one point. And mm -hmm. I know for somebody like me, I'm very experiential. So I'll just go, how am I feeling today? Yeah. But, but I won't necessarily remember how I felt yesterday or the day before <laughs> that. And I think there can be something useful to kind of, to measure that stuff. Not, not, not to do it a hard measure, but to, yeah. but to look back and go, oh, okay, over the last month i've been slowly going down what's that about let yeah. me make adjustments if i want to as opposed to wake up one day and be on the bottom and go oh yeah. i've just landed here yeah hey one thing i wanted to throw in there as well i see the time has flown by so quickly as <laughs> well um it's that notion of positive thinking because uh, i hear that a lot when people uh, hear positive psychology often they think positive thinking and uh, over the years, I come to address that. First, I was like, oh, it's not positive thinking. It's a science and it's this and it's that. Um, but actually, there's something to it. When we talk about uh, optimism, uh, yeah. for example, or um, particularly optimistic explanatory style, which is a way that we can explain things that have happened in the past or that happened right now in an optimistic way rather than in a pessimistic way. So away from, oh, everything's going to be all right in the future. When we look at this as a cognitive process, we can learn to be more optimistic. Uh, my dad's been a lawyer for 40 years, so I've been raised looking at the worst case scenario and how we can you know, stop that from happening. That's the lawyer mindset. Lawyers need that in order to do a good job. At some point, uh, and it was a bit of work, I chose to be more optimistic about things. So I, I can attest that it, this is possible. And mm. one of the things I hear most often from students and coaches who come through the course is that, what about people who are very negative? You know. And there's, first of all, conversations about what happiness actually means to them. But there's a lot about the cognitive processes that we apply to make sense of our world and us in it. And that's a, that's a, has a, there's a philosophical aspect to it, mm. but there's a very cognitive aspect to it. How the way that we think. And there's a lot that comes from positive psychology, but also borrows from cognitive behavioral practices. And there, this is where there's a lot of overlap between different uh, methodologies. Um, but there is a lot of value from positive psychology from people who are quite negative, so to speak, and you can help them to think more positively without the positive thinking of ignoring the negative or yeah, ignoring yeah. the reality of how things are like. Yeah, and we, we, could, we could have a whole debate around, you know, what do we mean by negative and, and what does yeah. somebody mean by that and what is positive? We don't quite have time for that today, but, but just kind of to highlight that and, and you know, you, you deliver positive psychology for us here at Animus. And I'm just, just curious in a, in a snapshot, what are the sort of things that you're bringing into that space to yeah. enable people to, to begin to look at it? Because that's a, a two day program where we start to yeah. uncover and play with some of these tools. I'm just curious about what, what some of those things might be. 
Exactly. I mean, a good starting point is the Animus lecture I've done a little while ago, um, where I introduced the kind of general uh, value of positive psychology and some of the theories around happiness and what are the pillars of well-being. So that's, that's what we're starting off with. What is the place of positive psychology within the coaching world? Um, a bit of an introduction to what it is, you know, introducing the science of it and um, what we can draw from it as coaches. Um, then looking at the well-being theories, and then we're looking at more than just happiness. We're looking at how do we work with character strengths as a coach um, with clients? How can we explore, uh, as I said, optimism and explanatory style? We mentioned, um, we mentioned flow and engagement. How can I help a client be more engaged at work or at home or in life in general? Um, what's the science behind it? But then particularly, what are some of the possible ways that we can apply that in a coaching setting? Without saying, this is how exactly you do it. I'm saying, I've done it in this way and I've done it in that way and I have colleagues who do it this way. So I put a bunch of stuff on the table and then participants or coaches can then look at, well, I think that could work for me. That could work for me. Take some things for a spin, uh, see something in a demonstration, um, try it out in a triad. You know, discuss with a with a client mm. and uh, perhaps an observer afterwards. What what was going on there? What was helpful? How did it feel? You know, we look at mindsets, growth, and fixed mindsets, and how we oh, can help lovely. people achieve those. Uh, we look at a lot of little interventions that have been tested uh, that can boost happiness or any part of it. Uh, we look a little bit of. Uh, we talked about assessments, so I'm introducing um, the 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 range of assessments that are out there. It's a very small uh, small part of the training. Um, but I'll, I'll give out a lot of these assessments that are freely available. So uh, people end up with a whole battery of uh, questionnaires and surveys that they might use in their, uh, in their practice. And then we end on, uh, you know, what's the future of positive psychology? I mentioned the second wave, for example. And uh, I always give people a bit of space to, to talk about how can I integrate that into the way that I work. And it's always amazing to see how differently different coaches take from positive psychology and place it into the way that they already work with clients. Um, so that's the weekend in a nutshell. Wow. It, it, it sounds absolutely uh, jammed, packed. Uh, so I'm sure it's a, a roller coaster of adventure and, and learning. And there was one word that you were saying there, and it just kind of it caught my attention. I just uh, wonder if you could just kind of sort of name what it is. And you, you talked about the science of things. I'm just curious when, when you use that word for some people that, that may have a very a cold edge to it, a kind of a throwback to school days. I'm just curious about how, when you talk about the science, what, what's that mean for you? Yeah, science for me is a, is a way of knowing things. So we're talking about epistemology, epistemology here after all those years still. Um, so how do we know things? Some people know things intuitively. Some things uh, use philosophy to figure out through logic what something abstract actually means. For some people, they just use their common sense. Uh, some people learn by doing things. So science is a way of knowing things. What we are doing is uh, we create certain hypotheses based on a measurement or an observation. And then there's a process of sharing what we have found out with other people who are studying the same thing. And if science is done well, that's why the academic language is so horrible to read sometimes because we're trying to be as precise as possible. Mm. And this is maybe where my German roots come in and connect with it strongly. But we're trying to be precise about showing other scientists what exactly have we done here? What have we observed? How have we measured it? And what are some, uh, some of the concerns we're having and where have we might gone wrong? And if a hundred scientists all study the same thing all over the world with different groups of people, then we can start combining different pieces of knowledge. And then other scientists come in and they look at the 50 pieces of research that have been done. And they look at the themes that are common in those. And then we can have an argument that, oh, if, if people study this kind of thing all over the world and they all come to this kind of conclusion, that's some really solid knowledge. You know, across cultures and across different people, we can be reasonably confident that if you do A, then maybe B gets produced. Uh, the kind of causation thing. Or mm. we can say, look, there's a connection between A and B. We're not quite sure how they interact and what causes the other, or if at all. Maybe they just kind of pop up. But that's the kind of sci exciting scientific process. Yeah. So it can be a bit dry when you read the papers, but if somebody translates it, and this is very much what I'm trying to do, if somebody translates it into a way that makes sense to us, like a coaching context when we're sitting down with a client, then we can start to appreciate the knowledge that comes out of it because we can use it in a way that is relevant. 
And I, you know, I, I love how you share that and explain it and, and make sense of it to enable somebody else to do their sense making uh, of, of it as well, to, you know, bringing those different parts together. And I think this is probably why you study so many different things. So you can kind of look at that broadness of uh-huh. what's, what's out there in the world and then bring that uh, to your practice and being able to understand it because you've looked at it. And I, you know, it makes me think about how as coaches, it's really important to look at the study of things and understand what sits behind the work that we do, not just the experience of the work. Yeah, that's true. Um, just, I do want to mention that the scientific study of things is only one way to create knowledge. Some things that we just know, science maybe hasn't caught up to it yet. You know, some things can be true without there being scientific proof for it. So I'm always open, particularly when it comes to coaching, because coaching is a one-to-one thing. You know, our client might just be in science, we call it an outlier. You know, outliers are the, the bits of data, like a person's answers to a question that doesn't fit the general theme that we have found. And in science, in statistical science, we can eliminate the outliers, you know, to have a a theory that makes sense because, you know, but we in coaching, we might just be talking to that outlier. So maybe our science doesn't work for them. And I think as coaches, regardless of the science, it's incredibly important that we're open to the possibility that we're talking to an outlier here and that all of our science is out the window and they need to make sense of their world in their own way. And that's what sits so beautifully with, with coaching and unknowing you know, being able to sit in a space and go, I, I don't know, I may have this bank of evidence, but in this moment with this person, I'm unknowing and I can't make assumptions about what will be or what might be. I can only explore this with the client and perhaps this data can, can help us to look at this. Mm-hmm. Or perhaps, as you say, this de- the, the client is an outlier of this data, yeah. so therefore this doesn't sit with them. But yeah, we can explore this-, this together and see where this takes us what's holding the client's agenda uh, mm-hmm. at the, the kind of the forefront of our minds. Yeah, and this is this beautiful ebb and flow between us and the client. Um, when we're tuning into the client and we're bracketing everything that we think we know from science and from everywhere else, and we're really tuning in and exploring that client's worldview. You know, we're in their shoes. We see things from their perspective. We can empathize and relate to them. And then we can tune out. And I often actually do that physically. And I kind of lean back and I let all of the science flow into my head again. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And this is interesting. This is not what I know, but this is what, you know, I get it. Um, So, and then you can start to make sense of things. And that is the beautiful dance of coaching, Mm. you know, but like, this is so difficult. Almost if you have more science, uh, the more science you know, the more science you need to bracket in those moments, in those phases when you're really tuning in with a client. And it can be challenging, you know, yeah. for a coach. Yeah. And it, you know, as you were talking about this, it, it reminded me of the polarities that sometimes exist, or how things can seem so opposite in a session with a, with a client, but they still exist within that singular person. And it's like yeah. how we yeah. allow ourselves and our clients to, to sit and, uh, and notice these things that seem at odds or difference to each other. <laughs> Yeah, you can see there's a a lot of excitement lies in uh, relating to people. And I think positive psychology brings a lot to the table that can inform our coaching and that can uh, give it an exciting edge because people do love talking about what makes them happy. And if you start a conversation with what's right about you, you know, that's a that's a different question that people don't usually hear. And it starts off the coaching in a really beautiful way with lots of positivity, you know, rather than, oh, what's wrong with you? What, are you? what problem are you here to solve? It's like, you know, what is your best possible self? Tell me about a time you were fully happy. Tell me about a time you were in your element and you were operating at your best, you know? Tell me about what you truly care about. Um, these are all positive psychology informed questions, you know, not exclusive to positive psychology coaching, but certainly an amazing way to, to uh, coach somebody. And I think it's a beautiful place to, to end our, our conversation as, we, as, as the listeners or the watchers explore. So, you know, what's, what's right about them? Um, Yannick, it's been a, a pleasure, as always, having this conversation with you. Um, I Likewise. look forward to our next one. And, um, uh, oh, just bef- before we end, if people want to uh, find you, if they want to get hold of you, where, where's a good place for them to head? Mm-hmm. Uh, www.existential.coach. And you'll find a lot about me there or uh, rocketsupervision.com is kind of my, my coaching arm of the, of the business. 
Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Yannick. Take care. Thank you, Rob. Bye-bye. Bye.